the historic west coast of Scotland can boast hundreds of mighty mountains, shimmering lochs, and miles of magnificent coastline. Even in the wettest of weather, there's always plenty to see. The West Highland Line travels through the very heart of it all, with ScotRail's super sprinters to speed you on your way. Since 1884, the West Highland Line has provided a spectacular introduction to this breathtaking region, making it one of the great railway journeys of the world. This isolated and virtually unknown area was opened up by the railways with a first line to Oban, then Fort William, and finally to Malague. But the start of the West Highland Line is Glasgow, Scotland's largest city. Heavy industry has now given way to the tower blocks and hotels of one of Europe's main cultural centres. But the mighty River Clyde still lies at the heart of this imposing city. Victorian heritage is all around, and George Square is a reminder of the heady days of empire when Glasgow was a powerhouse of the Industrial Revolution. The city chambers stand to the east with a guard of lands. Opposite is the Merchant's House, founded in 1605. Kelvin Hall is home to the Glasgow Museum of Transport. In steam days, Glasgow had no less than five locomotive works. The varied displays include representatives of all the major Scottish railway companies. As well as engines from the Highland Railway, the Great North of Scotland Railway, the Glasgow and South Western Railway, and the North British Railway, there are also smaller industrial locomotives, including this unusual fireless design. Pride of place must go to Caledonian Railway number 123. In 1888, this locomotive gained fame in the London to Edinburgh races and was the last single driven axle loco in British rail service. There's also a fine collection of trams. They disappeared from the streets of Glasgow in 1962. From Glasgow, Queen Street, we begin our journey, initially following the route of commuter trains along the Glasgow North electric line to Kilpatrick and Dumbarton. Beyond Kilpatrick, there are views over the Clyde as the river opens out into a wide firth. The town of Dumbarton is dominated by its castle, which stands on a prominent rock at the entrance to the Firth of Clyde. This was once the capital of the ancient kingdom of Strathclyde, which was absorbed into the United Kingdom of Scots in 1034. William Wallace, Mary Queen of Scots, and the hero king Robert the Bruce all have associations here. Across the water, commuter trains run between Glasgow and Greenock. The Firth itself is also busy with traffic.
Dumbarton was once famous for shipbuilding. Part of this heritage has been preserved by the Scottish Maritime Museum. The unique Denny tank, which was used for experiments with ship models. Now what they did in here was they made scale models of ships' hulls and test them in a controlled environment in a tank of water. Visitors can have hand-on experience down the stairs in the pattern shop where they can use the tools that they used to use years ago, scraping the clay and scraping the wax models. This is the type of wax, a piece of wax that they use. It's 95% paraffin, 5% beeswax. A pattern cutting machine is used to ensure that the wax hulls are exactly to scale. By testing such models in the experiment tank, the shipbuilders save both time and money. The dynamometer carriage would record speed, resistance and drag of the ship's hull. Passing into the highlands, there are a number of small stations serving the Lochside communities of Gerlochhead, Aracha, Tarbot and Ardloy. As the name suggests, Gerlochhead stands at the head of a long sea loch. This quiet fishing village is now dominated by the nuclear submarine base at Faslane. Loch Long is aptly named. This was once the gateway for Viking invasion. At its head is the Argyle Forest Park and the Aracha Alps. The most distinctive of these popular mountains is called the Cobbler, one of Britain's hardest peaks. Tarbot, there is a small craft centre where there are demonstrations of traditional handloom weaving. Well, the looms are around about 150 years old and it originally came out of a factory near Stirling. It was brought here in 1936. Before leaving this quiet little station, the sprinter must wait for a passing freight train. The line now runs above Loch Lomond to Ardloy where a small boat ferries passengers over the water. Loch Lomond is Scotland's largest loch and one of the most popular.
we pass into Bridal Bain, crossing the Glen Fallach Viaduct, the highest on the line. Beneath the viaduct are the dramatic falls of Fallach. is at Creanlerch. The original railway from Calendar was closed in the 1960s, but the extension to Oban now survives as a branch line. Today, the train divides with one half for Oban and the other for Fort William and Malay. This was once a busy rail junction for two competing railways, the Caledonian and the North British. Thirty years after closure, the impressive viaducts of Ben Ogle can still be seen. Long before the railways, this pleasant village was the territory of the clans Campbell and McNab. It now attracts less warlike people in the form of walkers and nature lovers. Ben Moor towers above the glen, which carries a long-distance walker's trail all the way to Fort William. Red deer graze on the hills, and Scotland's national emblem can often be found in bloom. As the glen opens into Strathfillian, the ruins of St. Fillian's Priory commemorate the first introduction of Christianity to the Scottish Highlands. Drum has two stations, one on the line to Fort William and the other on the Oban branch. Visitors are well provided for here. Side, their old lead mines. Gold is now mined here instead. Clinging to the hillside, the line rounds the great horseshoe curve between Benodair and Mendorain. This is an impressive display of Victorian railway engineering. Heading south, a Class 37 diesel pulls the evening sleeper train. The station at Bridge of Orchi lies to the south of Glencoe. It serves a tiny hamlet and hotel on an ancient route through the glens.
the west lies Glen Orchie. Even in the rain, this is a popular venue for trout fishing. Then the waterfalls of Is Erchein are at their most impressive. A little further afield is Glencoe, the most famous of all the Scottish glens. These brooding mountains are a challenge even to the most experienced climbers and mountaineers and were witness to a brutal massacre back in 1692. The line now runs across the desolate expanse of Rennach Moor. Remote and uninhabited, Rennach is one of Britain's largest areas of wilderness. The Shannay type station building at Rennach is easy to recognize. The footbridge is distinctively Scottish. This vast desert of peat bogs, heather, streams and lochs was crossed by floating the line on a bed of branches carrying thousands of tons of ash and earth. On the platform, a mural depicts the struggle of the first railway survey team. Nearly all were killed on this terrible moor. Also remembered here is Mr. Renton, who refinanced the line's construction. On Loch Rannach, there is a small Cranog, built to provide some security from clan warfare. Leaving the station, the train continues north over another viaduct and on to Corroa and the summit of the line at 1,350 feet. Dropping down to Loch Trig, the scenery changes again. In 1932, the track was realigned here and a new tunnel dug to allow for a hydroelectric scheme. The line curves round into Braes of Lachabo, heading for Roy Bridge. The early morning sleeper nears the end of its overnight run from Glasgow to London. This area was the ancient seat of the McDonald's, and at Achlochrach there are cairns and an ancient church, which hark back to those times.
Beyond the Monensee Gorge, we reached Speen Bridge. The bridge itself was built by Thomas Telford in 1819. On the hillside beyond the village stands an imposing memorial to the commandos who fell in the Second World War. This uncompromising terrain provided part of their training before going on active service. Nearby is the Nevis Range with Britain's only mountain cable car system. The gondola cars give access to the upper slopes of Anahor and in winter provide thousands of skiers with some of the highest and best skiing in Scotland. Finally, Fort William, a town dwarfed by the bulk of the mighty Ben Nevis. Fort William was founded by General Monk, who built a fort here in 1655 to repel Jacobite invaders. The overnight sleeper arrives from Glasgow to connect with the train to Malay. The threat to withdraw this sleeper service generated a massive protest throughout Scotland and the authorities have been forced to back down. With duties over, Mary Queen of Scots runs around her train before returning to the depot. Other than Inverness, this is the only locomotive depot in the Scottish Highlands. Behind the depot is old Inverlochy Castle. It was built in the 13th century by the common lords of Loch Harbour, who lost it almost immediately in the Wars of Independence. Fort William is the largest town on the west coast and the only shopping centre within a 50-mile radius. Here there's something for everyone. Around the town there are some delightful walks but the greatest attraction is Ben Nevis. 
it dominates the whole area. At 4,406 feet, it is the highest mountain in Britain. The easiest approach is from Glen Nevis. Many consider this to be Scotland's finest glen. The aluminium smelter at the foot of Benevis and the paper mill at Korpach are the biggest employers in the area. Every morning a freight train is made up to carry their products south. The railway reached Fort William in 1894 and work soon started on the extension to Malague. The prize was the rich fishing industry and the traffic to the Hebrides. The new line opened in 1901. Modern diesel units now work here. After crossing the river Lochy, the train approaches Banavi and Korpach on the Caledonian Canal. The Caledonian Canal is Britain's longest inland waterway. At Banavi, the line crosses the canal beneath Neptune's staircase, a remarkable series of eight locks. The Great Glen is a massive geological fault which almost slices the highlands in two. The obvious choice for a canal linking the Atlantic and the North Sea. In 1803, Thomas Telford was commissioned to construct a waterway to do just that, linking the three lochs between Loch Linney and the Moray Firth. The summit is only 90 feet high. Two thirds of it is climbed in this single flight of locks. The rail and road bridges swing open to allow the passage of both fishing boats and pleasure craft. There's a final lock before the canal enters the sea at the point where Loch Linney merges into Loch Hill. On 
onward now along the shores of Lochiel towards Glenfinian. Opposite the tiny station of Loch side, there's a salmon farm. There's often plenty of activity around the fish cages moored in the loch. As the line descends to Glenfinian, the scenery is even more dramatic. Glenfinian Viaduct is over 100 foot high and was Britain's first concrete viaduct. The use of this new material earned the contractor, Robert McAlpine, the nickname Concrete Bob. The viaduct and station stand at the head of Loch Shiel and command sweeping views out over the loch and the mountains of Moidart. The Glenfinian Monument was built in 1818, marking the spot where Bonnie Prince Charles unfurled his standard in 1745 and began his Jacobite Rebellion. The rebellion ended a year later in a crushing defeat at Culloden. The clan structure was destroyed. Highlanders were stripped of their right to wear tartan and even to use their own language. At the station, there is a small railway museum. There are hundreds of exhibits which help to explain the construction and history of the line. There's also an exhibition by leading railway photographers. Outside, the signal box has become a reference library and a railway coach has been converted to provide refreshments. Beyond Glenfinian is Loch Eelt. The trees on the islands are all that remain of the great Caledonian forest, which once covered all the highlands. The line runs down to the Atlantic now and Loch Nanuain, or Loch of the Caves. This is where Bonnie Prince Charlie first landed and his final departure point for France and exile. A small cairn commemorates the event.
There are still two more stops before Malague, Arisag and Morar. Arisag is warmed by the Gulf Stream and life is calm and relaxed. The village is famed for its glorious seascape and the tiny quay provides cruises to the small isles of Ram, Egg, Muck and Kama. Britain's most westerly station, the line runs north over Kepok Moss, a great expanse of peat moor. The deepest lake in Europe is Loch Moran, over 1,000 feet deep. The eye is drawn towards Neu Dart, Britain's last great wilderness. The loch is also home to Morag, cousin of the famous Nessie of Loch Ness. Britain's shortest river drains the loch over a series of spectacular waterfalls. The Mora estuary is blessed with an expanse of glorious white sand, inviting visitors to laze the day away. Finally, we arrive in Malague, 165 miles from Glasgow, and the end of the line. Malague is still one of the busiest fishing ports on the west coast. The pier and breakwater were built along with the railway, and the port now serves the car ferries to Skye and the Outer Hebrides. There are also plenty of shops here, along with a heritage centre, hotels, pubs, cafes, and a sea life centre. From Malag, we return to Fort William in order to explore the branch line to Oban. The Balakhulish branch once provided a rail service to Oban. It closed in 1965, but traces can still be found. The line took six years to build and was completed in 1903. At its peak, five trains a day ran in each direction. The impressive Connell Viaduct has a clear span of 500 feet and is now used for road transport. The fishing village of Oban had already become a thriving port before the arrival of the railway in 1880. The town is dominated by McCaig's Tower, 
begun in 1895 and abandoned on his death. It now gives breathtaking views over the harbour in the sound of Carrera. A modern cathedral and handsome stone buildings overlook the esplanade and busy harbour where yachts, fishing boats, steamers and ferries sail to the Western Isles. The town also makes its own whiskey. Open Distillery was founded in 1794 and the Stevenson brothers who founded the distillery were instrumental in founding the town of Oban itself. The whiskey is a West Highland single malt and is sold at 14 years of age. It is sold as one of the six classic malts. These are whiskies from the six main whiskey producing regions of Scotland. Visitors are able to tour the distillery and see all the processes involved. Oban is known as the gateway to the islands. One of the regular ferries sails to the magical island of Mau, an experience not to be missed. Awaiting the ferry on the other side is one of the steam trains of Scotland's only island railway, Mull Rail. This narrow gauge line was built in the 1980s to enable visitors to reach the newly opened Torosay Castle. Pride of place goes to Victoria, a Baldwin Type 262 tank engine built in 1993, specially for Mull Rail. The railway's original locomotive is named Lady of the Isles. At Tomstead Loop, Victoria waits for the diesel, Glen Alden, to pass. The line now enters the forest, an area of dense woodland, rhododendrons and wild garlic. From the station at Torosay, it's just a short walk to the stately home of Torosay Castle. The house was designed by leading Victorian architect David Price and was completed in 1858. Torosay was acquired by the Guthrie family in 1865 and is still their family home. The Italian gardens came later. The statue walk features 18th century Venetian statues.
Returning to the mainland, we rejoin British Rail for the journey up the Oban branch to Crown Larich. Approaching Tenuit on the shores of Loch Etif, the line runs through woods and rock cuttings. The loch attracts many birds, including herons and swans. At Tenuilt, historic Scotland has preserved Britain's most complete example of a charcoal fueled iron furnace. When Bonnowy was founded in 1753, the presence of trees rather than iron ore determined the siting of blast furnaces. A hundred years later, all of Loch Etif's birch and oak forest had been felled for charcoal. The furnace was driven by water power, and the finished pig iron was transported back to the owners in Cumbria via Loch Etif. Most of the loch is inaccessible except by boat, but each day there's a three-hour cruise into some of the finest mountain scenery in Scotland. Loch Etif in Gaelic means dark or roaring loch, and is actually classed as a fjord. During the Ice Age, glacial action scooped this out and it breaks into the sea. The mountains hereabouts on our right hand side is a Croatian range that extends all the way back to Dalmali and the highest peak there is 3,695 feet. To our left hand side is Ben Durnish, just under 2,000 feet. Now the vessel to our left is called the Gannet, uh, Ronnie Campbell, Skipper. Wildlife is equally spectacular. Golden eagles fly high above, while seals and cormorants bask on the rocks. Kruchen, Loch Orr and Dalmali are next. After the trains pass beneath the shadow of Ben Kruchen through the boulder-strewn Pass of Brandon. Falls of Kruchen is the latest station on the line and serves the visitor center at the Kruchen hydroelectric power plant. Special electric buses run to the turbine hall, almost a mile into the heart of the hollow mountain. Now one thing to note as we enter the 
tunnel that certain sections of the wall have been lined with concrete. Inside, it's warm enough for tropical plants. Excavation work started in the spring of 1962 with the boring of the initial tunnels to give access to what was to be the roof level of the main cavern. And you'll appreciate the vision, skill and achievement of this British engineering project which was designed, constructed and installed over a five year period. More than a thousand feet up is the reservoir which supplies the head of water for the turbine. Loch Awe is one of Scotland's longest, deepest and most beautiful lochs. In the summer, the little steam launch, Lady Rowena, provides regular cruises. Churn Castle are set dramatically on the shores of the loch. This was once the Campbell stronghold, when the Highlander earned his living from cattle. The clearances followed when thousands of people were evicted to make room for sheep. Malley, there is a unique octagonal church. The line from Crean Lerch reached here in the 1870s, some years before it arrived at Oban. To the south of the village, there is a memorial to the celebrated Gaelic poet, Duncan Ben McIntyre. It provides splendid views back to Loch Awe and Ben Cruch. of the journey follows Glen Lochy back to Tindrum and Cran Larach. It has been a magnificent journey, but there is one final treat in store. Every summer, there are special trains on the line to Malaig. Normally, these are hauled by preserved steam locomotives stationed at Fort William. But a long period of dry weather has led to a ban because of fire risk. The depot's Class 37 diesel locomotives come to the rescue and ensure that the Jacobite departs on time.
frequent trip, there's a short break at Glenfinion, allowing time to take in the views and listen to the pipes.